Without further ado, let us say hello to the outlaw, Dan Hardy, who did a great uh, breakdown of the event on his YouTube channel. I suggest you go check that out. As always, Dan, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. I'm really good. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, great to see you in the uh, familiar locale. I appreciate the time, as always. Uh, by the way, before we get to London, could I ask you, what the heck happened with July 2nd? I feel like there was like all this buildup, and then it just kind of like fizzled out, and the thing never... But what happened? Yeah, I know. So they added the the Huey Fury uh, title eliminator fight to the card. And then with that came a Sky Sports deal, which of course is is a big deal. And then uh, Huey got sick or or injured. I'm not sure exactly what. And they decided they were going to move the whole event along with, uh, with him to uh, November 12th. So everything's still moving forward, but it's just been moved back to November 12th. So um, I, I slowed down for a couple of weeks and maybe put five pounds back on and then you know, training has started again uh, today. So, uh, yeah, back, back in motion for November 12th, but a bit of oh. a setback, which is disappointing. And how far away, like like how how many weeks away were you from the event when it got postponed? I, I was two weeks away. So oh. I was in the last, last week of training camp before fight week started. I, I was I was feeling good. I mean, I still do, to be honest. I've, uh, you know, I've kept my weight down and, and I've been moving around and, and uh, you know, work, went back to my strength and conditioning. But I know Diego is excited for, for November as well still. So it's, bit of a delay but uh it's okay and mentally like you were so close to coming back the big comeback a decade in the making like mentally how was it when you had to you know come to terms with the fact that it wasn't happening july 2nd oh it was disappointing yeah it was very disappointing especially because i you know i just got back from a four mile run and i was feeling really good you know i was it was just nice to be back in that groove again ready to compete um, and you know the thing of course i was it was looking forward to the most is that you know the walk out into the arena and the opportunity to get that adrenaline rush of trading punches with someone. Um, and, you know, the other thing is if it had happened in July, it would have been under 10 years. Uh, <laughs> but now it's been moved back to November. That means it will be a, a, actually a decade since the last time I fought. So, uh, yeah, that's it's kind of funny. But I was trying to avoid that. I was trying to avoid the 10-year mark. But now it's uh, it's unavoidable. And is Ricky still staying on the card? Yeah, okay. Ricky. Ricky was even on vacation this week, and he's still training, posting videos every day of him working out. He, he got in incredible shape. And right. I mean, you know, it, it was disappointing for me, but I didn't have to do nearly as much work to to get my weight down as Ricky did. You've got to imagine how disappointed he was. Uh, yeah, r really, uh, r really set us back. But we're you know we're in motion now. And same location. Yeah, same location, AO Arena in Manchester. By the way, were you going to walk out to England belongs to me? Were you going to walk out to that song? You know, I was going to change it. I was what? thinking about using something different. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I just kind of, I felt like that was, an, that was an, uh, a song that was attached to my UFC career. You know, I, I didn't use that song before the UFC. Oh. You know, I came out to a mixture of things from like Kano to Martha and the Vandellas. Uh, so I used to change my walkout music quite a lot. And then when I arrived in the UFC, that was kind of a statement to everybody else that, you know, like, you know, I was going to be the, the the premier UK fighter was was my uh, my intention with that message. Uh, but then, I, you know, I re-recorded it with Cox Barra uh, ahead of the, the GSP fight. And I I got my got my ass kicked what, three times, three times in a row, four times in a row <laughs> using that song. So I had to switch it again back to the old one for um, Ludwig. Oh, no, no, I use a different song for that as well. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to use a different song again. I know people will be disappointed, but we'll see. You're done with it. You want to move on. I don't know. I just kind of feel like it's, you know, it's a different thing, isn't it? It's a boxing match. I'll have right. big gloves and shoes on. And, you know, I think people would be really disappointed if I didn't have a red mohawk. But I think I've got a bit of a bit of lee leeway with the walkout music. Interesting. And and by the way, who chose that song? Was that one where Dana or Lorenzo said we want you to walk out to this? No, that was me. That, okay. that was all me. That they're a 1970s punk band, you know, and I was fortunate enough to have a, my mum and dad's record collection when I was growing up. And my dad's my dad's record collection was stacked with, you know, Sex Pistols and The Clash and The Jam and Cox Sparrow was mixed in there amongst it. And I just always liked the, you know, the gang vocals, which you get in a lot of New York hardcore as well. It, you know, get, gets me riled up. Feels like a war song. And you, were you going to come out with the Red Mohawk? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was wow. growing it back, but then you know, I decided to go for a growing up haircut. Okay, you know, I can grow the mohawk back overnight; it's no bother. And so you'll do it for November because that would be iconic. Yeah, and and, and yeah, yeah, the hanky as well. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, people will be disappointed. Yes, know, if yes. I didn't. Well, 
I was going to say I'd be disappointed if you didn't come out to that song, but look, whatever makes you happy, as long as we're getting the Mohawk, the Hanky, all that. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm dying to get your thoughts on, on Saturday, and I'm happy that the fight is still on for you. If I could ask, and I don't know if I asked you this after the fight in, in, in March, the event in March, but what grade would you have given that event, and what grade would you give this event this past Saturday? I mean, you can't really compare them, unfortunately. You know, the the, the one back in March was a, was a spectacular event, and and a lot of it rides on the main event, of course, because you always feel, and this is why the UFC's you know uh, production value is so good, is because they know how to build the event towards the the main event, the crescendo, and when, of course, it is you know it ends so quickly, immediately you can just you can just feel the energy just just dissipate. And that that's always, you know, people are never going to look back on that with the same kind of memories as they were. Tom Aspinall, you know, putting the cherry on the top of the cake in, in UFC uh, London back in March where he dominated Alexander Volkov. You know, if he'd have done the same thing against Curtis Blaze, then it would have absolutely been a comparable event, if not better. Uh, but unfortunately, with the way it ended, you've just you've just kind of got to go with the, the March event. I still enjoyed it, though. We still had some really standout performances. And again... You know, uh, Molly and Patty stole the show. Can you even like put into words this whole Molly and Pat, Patty thing? It's it's crazy. And like we've seen rises. Obviously, the most famous one is Connor. For these two friends to do it together, and they're so unique, and they're fin and, like the two great finishes on the card came from them, right? Um, it's just like as someone who has you know literally built this scene pioneer of the scene to see these two scousers do what they're doing and to see their explosion how do you put into words what's happening here it's incredible you know it really is incredible i mean of course you know conor mcgregor was a was a phenomenon and the reason why that happened was because mma is growing but with the growth of mma are going to come teams where you've got multiple fighters competing at, at a very high level and having success it's it's actually happening across the country, across Europe at the moment. You know, you look at cage warriors that happened on the Friday night. You've got the Figlak brothers, Mateus and, and, and Mick, uh, Michael. Then you've got the Hardwick brothers. George Hardwick just won the belt. You've got Harry Hardwick as well. You know, you, we've got a lot of siblings that are coming through, a lot of teammates. And it's the same with the next generation crew. You know, you look at, at the mat that, uh, that Molly and Paddy are training on every day. And you've got the likes of, you know, Luke Riley and Adam Cullen and, and, and Nathan Fletcher, fighters that are coming through, training with these guys every day and improving. It's not going to be long before we've got half a UFC card stacked with these fighters that are coming from the same gym. Like The talent is just growing exponentially, and that's partly down to the impact that, that uh, those two have had. Not only are they very likable, very personable, you can you can get on board because you just know they're having a good time and they're riding it so the wheels fall off. And they're 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 a hundred percent genuine. You get nothing but the, but real from both of them. We saw that from Molly afterwards. She was very kind of you know very kind of calm after a, you know when she was being announced the winner and very kind of honest about where she was at and uh, excited about where she's going for sure. It was a different Molly McCann. But then Paddy on the other side, the emotions finally come out after a, you know a really tough few weeks. They just they're just impossible not to like. And then the way that they fight as well is electric. Uh, do you recall the first time you heard about Patty or saw Patty compete? Yeah, it was at a Cage Warriors. They were on the same card in Liverpool. And if the UFC is ever able to go back to Liverpool and put those two on the card together, they will absolutely take the roof off the place. And I know that that's, that's an overused phrase. But, I mean, you know, I've seen Paddy win fights in the first round by rear naked choke, dive into the crowd, and there are there are a thousand kids that are like, 15 years old that have all got the same hat and jacket and they just erupt. And then as soon as it's done, they put all the chairs back, they put the lights back up, they put the barriers up. I mean, they are well-behaved kids, but they they just go off when when Paddy wins. And it's the same with Molly. The the atmosphere they could create at those Cage Warriors events was was something else. You knew something special was coming. It was only a matter of time before they arrived. And it, it it's it's just fortunate that you know, Molly had a little bit of a turbulent career to start with in the UFC, and now she's picked up this momentum at the same time as Paddy arriving. It's, you know, it, it's it's going to make for a good movie one day. Paddy's story is so interesting to me because, like, you can't help but be captivated by him because of his look, because of how he acts, his accent, his whole vibe is just fun. And then he's killing it in Cage Warriors. And I believe, you know, 
several years ago, he's offered a UFC deal and he says, I'm not ready yet. I don't want it just yet. I'm being paid. I remember there was a whole thing about where he's going to sign. And he said he was going back to cage warriors and people were disappointed. Then he hits a rough patch in cage warriors and people are quick to say, oh, he screwed up. He blew it. He was a never was builds himself back up. And now, you know, here he is enjoying success in retrospect. Like when you saw him hit that rough patch, did you think, oh man, this guy made a mistake, he's not going to make it, he doesn't have what it takes, mentally he's not tough enough. Like, What do you remember thinking about him when he hit that patch where he was losing like two of three? You know, my main concern was that he was having a lot of success for a young man and he was a superstar in a city that would just celebrate him everywhere, everywhere he went. And I think, you know, a young man being in a city like that, you know, we see it from a lot of, a lot of like young champions and young successors. They, they get all this attention and all this love and they kind of wander off the tracks a little bit. And the other problem that Paddy always had was that he was cut into a weight class that didn't suit him. You know, I know he did a lot with uh, Paul Reed, his nutritionist, and I know they put him through a, a whole load of tests and, and made it clear to him and to his team that it was time for him to move up a weight class. And I think now we can see a far more physical Paddy Pimblett. You know, he's grown into his body, but I also think he's grown into his into his his career as a professional. Like there were points in his in his cage warriors career where he was surviving on you know raw ability and and uh, and athleticism because he would just kind of throw everything at his opponent and oftentimes he was blasting them out the water. But there were a couple of times when he you know he he, he looked to come into some some tough waters and I think he's learned from those moments. And the time when he turned the UFC down, I think it was when Darren Till was was fighting uh, Wonderboy Thompson in Liverpool and everybody expected uh, Paddy to be on that card and he wasn't and. The fact that he turned it down made me wonder whether you know he was he was determined to become a an international star or whether he wanted to just kind of be the local star. But it was obviously the right call. Physically, physically he wasn't ready. Probably mentally, he knew he wasn't quite ready. And he's arrived with you know three big performances and uh, you know a lot of fans. <laughs> he's, he's doing he's doing big things, and and I don't think it's going to be long before we see him in some uh, you know main event co main event positions. Uh, we'll get to what is next for him in a moment, but you know it, it's a it's a crazy thing with Patty because speaking of Ricky Hatton, who used to be called Ricky Fatten, right? He would blow up and then he would come back down. We're seeing this with Patty as well, and and I think he uh, was annoyed at some of this talk at the weigh end. He he mooned everyone, but would you suggest that he try to stop that? Like at some point, it's going to get harder and harder to cut that weight, right? Uh, absolutely you know the older he gets the more that weight's going to cling to his frame and it's also not good for his for his body physiologically you know you don't want to keep stretching your skin and then forcing it to contract and stretching it. it it can you know it can cause all kinds of issues you know internally as well as externally you know receiving you know damage to the skin cuts and stuff you know you tend to find a lot of fighters that swell up and then shrink they they cut easier and paddy's been very fortunate you know he's got good tough skin but keep you know that this yo-yo in in weight is not is not ideal for him especially long term i'm sure it's just a it's just an outlet from the pressure that's on his shoulders you know you've got to think how you know how hard he works to to get in the condition that he's in but i think you know now he's arrived in the ufc he's got his he's found his feet i think he can stabilize that a little bit you've got to remember though i mean you know those guys are from the north of england it gets really cold up there so it doesn't surprise me that he's, he's adding some insulation to his frame but I, you know, I think he's naturally a growing boy anyway, and, and the more he allows his weight to fluctuate, the more he's going to struggle to get to lightweight. If you were in charge, we were debating this earlier in the show, um, who he should fight next and where. I, I said MSG, put him on that MSG card in November. Uh, that's a big deal. You get the rub. Uh, you're on pay-per-view now. You're a pay-per-view star. And I was saying, let this slow roll build for as long as possible. Give him a guy who's not ranked. I don't care. You know, the guys were, I was talking to New York Rick and, and GC on the show, they were saying, uh, you know, maybe a, a Dan Hooker or a Jalen Turner. I say, give him a guy, like, give him a, J- and I'm not trying to knock a Jamie Malarkey, but like he does, I don't think you need to test him just yet because the star is shining. He's exploding. No one's asking for this. If you were in charge, what would you do? Yeah, I don't. I don't think he's ready for another, for another a, a step up. I mean, someone like Dan Hooker, that's a, that's a big step up. You know, you've got to think that some of the killers that he's been in there with and the experience that he has. Like Paddy, yes, he's got three big wins already in the UFC. Big because of the way that they they hit resonated with the fans, but not big because they were perfect or because they were against, you know, potential world beaters in their own right. You know, he's he's fought the right level of opposition for the level that he's at. 
I mean, if you know, I think if you want to step him up, you got you know, you had Ludovic Klein that that picked up a win over Mason Jones a bit later on in the card. That would be a logical step up. You know, he's going to fight someone that's a tough, durable European fighter that is going to be able to push him in the grappling range as well as strike him. I think that's, you know, something like that would be a logical step. We, we don't need to be giving him one of the star names right now. Just because he's a developing star, it doesn't mean that he's, he's at, at the, the technical level yet to start taking on some of those big challenges. I still think there's a bit of growth left in his game, maybe another 12 months or so, a couple of three more wins. And then we start to look at him fighting those recognizable names. I thought that it was his best performance in the UFC and he did not seem happy with it. But considering the opponent and considering what he did, like the actual finish, trapping the arm, the knee, all that stuff, like I was really impressed. He didn't get rocked. In the other two fights, there was a moment there where he gets rocked. I was actually really impressed. What, it, what like Of the three, where would you rank this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it was the cleanest. It was the it was the less the least reckless of of the, the the three fights that he's had, and I think that's promising because you know, of course, we like that recklessness because it's exciting. But you know, that's where the gaps are in, in people's games, and that's usually where people get caught with counters. I, I I think you know, I think he expected to be under pressure from Levitt because he's a good a good grappler and a strong wrestler, and I think because Levitt recognized that Paddy, you know, he's a he's a fast sprint attacker. When he starts, he doesn't like to stop you know, for a good few seconds. And he's probably got the, the, the power advantage over the two of them. Um, the, the way he finished, though, I mean, wrapping up that kind of reverse anaconda to knee him in the head and then circling to the back to trap the arm was was a beautiful finish. And, you know, there have been lots of rear naked chokes in Paddy's, uh, Paddy's career. He's a, he's a prolific finisher, it's a, kind of a signature of his team, to be honest, up against the fence. But that for me was, I mean, there was just no way out for Levitt. And, and I think he felt safe while Paddy was slowly edging towards the, the closing of the submission. Really nice. Very, very slick. You know, you, you've got to you've got to put his submission game up there with some of the best of them that, that are, you know, around him in the division. Maybe not the top flight of the division, but certainly is he's on the trajectory to be competitive. Do you like the idea of putting him at MSG? I, I don't see why not. You know, I think it will give his, his his fans an opportunity to travel, and I think he will have a lot of traveling fans. You know, I think Liverpool will take over New York, and I think that'll be a, a fantastic experience, not only for the fans but also for the UFC to have another one of those traveling fan bases. I mean, you mentioned Ricky Hatton, and he was he was a, an amazing he had an amazing traveling fan base and band. You know, with the drums and trumpets and everything, it would be very similar with with Paddy Pimlet. So you know, to put him on one of those cards would um, it would allow the U.S. audience to really kind of consume him amongst the, the other mainstream fighters. You get, uh, We're just having a little uh, video problem here, but can you see me or no? I can see you fine, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And we could see you. That one thing you're doing there, Joe, is taking him out. So just be, look at the screen also when you're... Look at that one, the monitor too. Um, there's a, This is what happens when you're live, Dan, the, the beauty of live television um, or, or YouTube. The one thing that I was wondering about Molly was it seems to me, and I was equating it to like when you're out and with your when you're with your friends or when you're not with your friends, it feels like ever since Patty showed up, the confidence that she has just in her own skin, in the cage, going for a finish, like she's not the same person that was fighting in the UFC two years ago. Do you do you sense this? Because like where does like how do you explain? Obviously, there's growth, there's evolution, there's improvement, but it feels like she's just a completely different human being ever since Patty arrived. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I do agree with that, and I think you know there's there's a lot of familiarity with them sharing a locker room and and being in training camp together and getting in shape together. Um, I was also very impressed though with Molly after her last victory and the mindset that she had. You know, I, I saw her a couple of weeks afterwards um, warming up fighters at Cage Warriors, and she was, you know, she was in just as good a shape as she was when she fought. She was, you know, clear of mind. She looked like she'd been training that day, and, and she just said, "I've just realized that in order to compete with the best, guy, best, you know, best fighters in my division, I've got to be on it all the time." And you know, now Paddy's around. I think some of her uh, maturity in her UFC career is going to rub off onto Paddy as well. After the, you know, after he's had this little uh, celebration, I think he's going to be back in the gym much quicker. I don't think he's going to get get as out of shape as he has before. Um, and I think the part of that will be down to Molly, you know, kind of leading the way a little bit with that. But she also massively benefits from Paddy's energy, both in the dressing room and you know in training camp. 
it's amazing. I remember when Patty was in Cage Warriors, he was kind of like needling Connor a little bit, and there was some talk of him fighting Connor. This is when Connor was like, you know, 2016 Connor. And now you compare the rises. Patty's going to his fourth fight in the UFC. Connor's fourth fight, he was getting ready to fight Dustin Poirier. We're not talking about any Dustin Poirier's for for Patty right now, right? Like it's could you compare the difference? Like, what is the difference between Patty at this point? Because he waited and Connor had the two titles as well, but they're different fighters, right? They're they're at different points in their career going into the fourth fight. Yeah, the, you know, they are different fighters. And they also have a they also have, you know, very different games, which gives us a different perception of them as fighters. You know, because Conor McGregor had such good boxing and footwork, and because he was able to deliver that left hand in so many different ways it made him look almost untouchable. Whereas because Paddy's game is stacked at the opposite end, because he's such a strong grappler, sometimes we see him come through chaotic and risky moments that we didn't see in McGregor's career. You know, had he fought more talented grapplers, then, you know, perhaps we would have done in those, in those earlier fights, but you know, his fights were perfect for him to demonstrate his striking skills, but Paddy's come up against guys that will stand their ground and throw back. And because he doesn't have the same kind of, polished level of striking that McGregor did, <clears throat> you know, he gets caught sometimes. I think they're in different places and I think it's difficult to compare the two of them. But, um, you know, you could certainly see it building to a super fight in, in the future oh my at some gosh. point. Just, just not anywhere near and just not no. anywhere near it right now. Like Conor's up near the top of the division. Paddy's got to build himself into that position. But I would hope Paddy's focus is on the belt as opposed to the super fights right now because he's he's in a he's in a very strong position where he could become something way more than Conor McGregor, and I know that's something you know that's that's a difficult thing for us to imagine, but we couldn't have imagined Conor McGregor before he stepped out of Cage Warriors. You really think he could be bigger than Conor? Yeah, for sure, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think especially because you know people's brands change and shift. You know, Conor is, you know, Conor's not the same. He's not he's not as easy to to gravitate towards as, as he used to be in the beginnings of his career. You know, it's much more easy to relate to people when they've stepped off the streets and they're going through hard times. Now he's, you know, living on yachts and stuff. I think he's, I think he's quite estranged from his, from his fan base. And I think people will tune in due to the fact that he's a, you know, he's, he's an entertainer, but I think people will follow Paddy to a, to a, a much uh, longer degree than, than they have done Connor because I, I don't think Paddy's going to fall off in the same way that Connor did and you know find himself in handcuffs. And and what do you think Paddy's ceiling is? Like do you think he can be a champion? I think he's in the most difficult division, but I think what we learned from McGregor's rise is that you know your marketability will create opportunities that will, you know, build you in the right direction and you know I mean like you look at some people's careers through the lightweight division and you think, my goodness, how did that guy never get a title shot after going through that line of killers? And then other people, you're like, how has this person ended up in the top five already? And, you know, that's it's not necessarily a meritocracy of the UFC, as we know, and that's down to partly marketability. And Paddy's very marketable. If he makes the UFC a lot of money, they'll they'll help that direction. They'll help that path through to the belt. Um and, you know, and I, I certainly think anybody you put him in there with, he's, he's within striking distance of winning because of the chaos that he brings. It's only going to be the top level grapplers in the division, the top 10 guys, or like the guys that could stop him taking them down, maybe like the Gillespies and the Makachevs and the, you know, Sarukians. That's where he might start to come unstuck. But they could also, you know, find a way through that division without him facing those guys. By the way, how how long before they start talking about Molly and Valentina? Because like she's such a big star, right? I feel like they're gonna have to do it at some point. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of moving in that direction. Of course, there are there are quite a few fighters in Molly's way, but again, you know, if she's matched correctly, if she's if she's put in front of fighters that, uh, you know, she she can play rock and sock em with and and stuff takedowns, then she can punch her way to to a shot at Valentina Shevchenko, especially because you know she's got the division locked down. You know, I mean, this is this is the welterweight division. When I was uh, might making my way through to fight GSP, you're like he cleared the division out. Like I didn't have to fight Thiago Alves or John Fitch or any of those killers because they needed contenders. You know, I was moved through a lot quicker than than and I should have been because they were. You know, he'd already done a lot of the work for me. Mm. Valentina's done the same thing. That's why it's going to be easier for Molly to get to the belt than it is for Paddy because that belt in the lightweight division will keep changing hands. But Valentina might be there in a couple of years, and and you know, 
they might be desperate for contenders. And, and I think Molly could, could get herself inside the top 10 and, and certainly make an argument for it. Um, I'd watch it. It'd be a lot of fun for sure. Uh, that that is a great point, by the way, about the belt changing hands and her path being a lot quicker. Uh, just a couple more things, and then I'll let you go. This is tremendous insight, and we appreciate it very much. And by the way, have you done your breakdown for BT yet for two seventy seven? Is that up yet uh, uh, on the YouTube? Is that up yet? I don't think it's up yet, but it is done. It is done and edited, so I would imagine that's up later today or tomorrow early. Okay, those are always fantastic. Uh, be on the lookout for that YouTube dot com slash BT Sport. Uh, what what about the rest of the card? Was there anyone else, especially like the UK fighters, that really impressed you? The, the main one that stood out to me was Nathaniel Wood. I thought that was by far the best performance that we've seen out of his entire career. You know, he's had some some real bangers, some highlight reel finishes. You know, I remember his fight against Josh Reed on Cage Warriors that was a a, a shootout until he managed to land the knockout punch. And as much as I like that, I don't want to see that all the time from him because I think his potential is very very high. Um, and I watched him, I was at GB top team the other week, watching him sparring with his teammates. Uh, and, you know, he's got guys that can push him there. Of course, Mark Jacques is in the same team as him now as well, who, you know, who is definitely growing as a fighter, but Nathaniel just looks so slick against Rosa, who we know is tough and durable and can absolutely take a beating. And Nathaniel dominated him. Great footwork, you know, patience in the striking range, a variety of attack targets, I was incredibly impressed with him. Better than I've ever seen him before. Wow, that is high praise. What about Leon Edwards, speaking of the UK scene? What kind of a chance do you give him on August 20th? You know, I give him a good chance. I, I You know, he he caused all kinds of issues for, for Usman the last fight. He didn't take any damage. You know, he was he was able to, to you know, to, to be competitive enough in, with his takedown defense to slow the fight right down. I think the difference in this one is that Usman's confidence in his striking is in a different place entirely. You know, you look at what he did to Masvidal and to Gilbert Burns, you you think to yourself, he could quite easily do uh, the same thing to Leon, especially after we saw Nate hurt him. I mean, that's the thing that would stick out in my mind. If I'm Kamaru Usman, I'm thinking Nate Diaz hurt him in in the last round. If I catch him with one of my shots, you know, left hand or right hand, I'm gonna hurt him really bad. And I think the double threat of him potentially level changing is going to keep Leon on the back foot. I think we need to see a confident, dominant performance from Leon. And, and we don't always see that. Sometimes we we see him let fighters drift and get away from him. Like he should have finished RDA, in my opinion. He should have finished Cowboy, in my opinion. He let Nate get into the last round. That was dangerous, you know. I, I don't think he can he can keep playing that game with these guys. I think it's time for him to put it, he's put himself in fourth or fifth gear and start stopping some of these guys. Um, and I think he's striking, his counter striking, his footwork is good enough to cause Usman some problems. Um, but he's got to do it with confidence. If he doesn't, then he's going to get backed up and wrestled and clinched and beaten up at close range. And he's going to be vulnerable for those straight punches. Last one. Speaking of Nate, can he beat Hamzat? Oh. Do you, you know, like the this, fight? This it just it just feels like it feels like we're getting to the point where someone should start thinking about pressing charges. It, it's, it doesn't feel like a fair fight. It feels like a very, very cruel thing to do to someone that is a legitimate legend. Because they've spoken out against the organization, they're going to get executed live on TV. That's kind of how it feels. And and and, I, and it just it makes me feel uncomfortable to think that that's the way it's going to go down. Like, I, I hope, desperately hope, that Nate at least comes through it all right. But after watching what what Hamzat did to to Reese McKee and to uh, you know to John Phillips, yes, of course Nate's got good jujitsu, but there comes a point where jujitsu is nullified by good wrestling. It happened in the early days of the UFC, and it would happen against Nate if it hits the floor. I think he gets nullified, and I think he gets beaten up horrendously from the top position. I think it's going to be uncomfortable to watch, and I think it's going to leave the UFC in a very very bad light. And I just hope Nate comes through it all right. Because I think he's got good opportunities outside the UFC. It's just a shame that they're going to do this assassination attempt on him before he leaves. Wow. Uh, those are strong words. And I think a lot of people agree with you. It's a weird spot. Someone they, If he would have resigned, they would have never booked the fight. But now that he's saying, I don't want your deal. I want to go out and test the market, see what else is out there. They're like, all right, here's the toughest guy out there. When just two weeks ago... 
Dana is saying in the media, this guy's lost four of five. He's no longer, and he's not even ranked in the welterweight division, but it's very clear what they're doing. And I think you laid it out there perfectly. So I think we all hope he doesn't get seriously hurt. If he pulls it off though, holy crap. One of the craziest moments I mean, in the history I mean, of the sport. Right. It would be, and I love, I love Hamzat Chemaev. I just think he's, he's, he's not in the right, they're in different positions right now. Chemaev's on the rise and Diaz is a, you know, a legend that is on his way out. You know, it, it's, it, it's just a fight that shouldn't be happening. But of course, you know, if Nate pulls it off, it would be the most Diaz thing to do in the world. And <laughs> he'll walk off into the sunset with a, you know, with a, a smile on his face. Um, it, yeah, I, I think I said what I needed to about it. I just feel very unfortunate that it's happening and that we can't celebrate these fighters when they're coming to the end of their career. But it's it's, it's the UFC style, isn't it? You know, if, if they decide there's parting ways with you, they try and damage you at every in every way possible. And Unfortunately, if you're a fighter and they want to damage you, they can actually physically do it, which is a shame. Dan, you're the man. Always a privilege to have you on to to absorb some of your insight. Uh, you're doing great work on your YouTube channel. You're doing great work for BT. Keep doing your thing, my man. Your post-fight recap is up right now. I saw it yesterday. Great stuff, as always. You're doing stuff with Veronica as well. She's doing a great job, so kudos to her. Uh, well done, and thank you, as always, for the time, and good luck in November. Can't wait for it. Thanks, Ariel. Always a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Thank you so much. There he is, the outlaw, Dan Hardy, 